director at the administration office of the Millshoe Independent School District. And we are going to talk with Joe Adams, and he has a presentation for the Millshoe Schools, and especially for Millshoe High School, to Dr. R. L. Richards. Well, I, this is a great opportunity for me to give something back to Millshoe. I think that most people know that my mother, mother and father were 70-year residents here, and they just passed away in the past uh, three years. So uh, everything that is kind of uh, part of my future after Mule I owe to my parents and to this place. And when this honor came to me in the past couple of years, being designated as a Hall of uh, Fame football player at my alma mater, Dartmouth College, to where I went after uh, Mule High School, I thought that uh, I would share this with the high school and if they could find a place of honor for this, it might be an inspiration to some students who like myself from Mulechu High School had the wanderlust to go to a, a place, continue to do what they love to do and that was play football. But of course, uh, Dartmouth is a place where I can both play football and pursue my academic interests which were kindled here at uh, Mulechu High School just like my uh, football skill. And that, that honor uh, came to, to me, and I wanted to share it with uh, Mr. Richards and, and the future Muleshoe High School graduates. Dr. Richards? Muleshoe Schools is glad to receive this picture of the Hall of Fame for Mr. Adams, and we'll be glad to display it in appropriate places, and we're just excited about Joe's success and all he's owed to uh, Muleshoe Schools and what he's done, and we're proud of him, and we want to share this with our students. So very nice of you, Joe Adams. Now we're going to talk with Gail and Joe Adams here at Muleshoe ISD Administration Office. Gail, how long have you been married? 41 years. 41 years. How did you meet? This guy walked into the studio where I was working and uh, he had a swagger from Texas that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we were students together in the master's program at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, uh -huh. studying architecture. Both in architecture, and you're both still working in that profession. We certainly are. Isn't that wonderful? Now, Joe, you all just had a birthday. Yes, my wife and I have birthdays that are three days apart. Mine is March the 1st, hers is March the 4th. So we decided 70 is a milestone, and we threw a little uh, party at our place in Houston, inviting our three children and their significant others, and in one case, their children, our grandchildren, to come down to Houston for three days in March. And that was just over with, and it was uh, very successful. And you have a picture here. Do you want to hold that up and uh, hold it real still for a few minutes? Now, you didn't mind telling your age, did you? No, I, I worked hard for all those 70 years. So. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Uh, well, that was a wonderful event. But now, why do you have on Western uh, uh, garb? Well, one of our daughters, the oldest daughter, typically kind of is the bossy one. She said, okay, Dad, I'll come to your and Mom's birthday if you get us tickets to Garth Brooks at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. So even though she lives in Seattle, she's got some uh, country girl in her. She likes country music. She was a singer, and, and uh, so you can take the girl out of Texas, but maybe you can't take Texas out of the girl here. So well, now, um, over here on the wall behind you, Gil Robert, are a couple of pictures. Tell us about those. Well, in addition to playing football at Muleshoe High School, I, uh, with the help of my parents, discovered a wonderful lady who is an artist herself and who was kind enough to open her home to students who were interested and teach us the fundamentals of painting, drawing, and in general studying the, the history of art. She uh, gave us those kind of deep lessons and uh, gave us 
philosophical conversation. Now, who was this lady? Uh, Elizabeth Black. She, at the time, was not a teacher in, in the school systems in uh, Muleshoe, but later became, uh, uh, so it was not art in the schools, but it was art Saturday afternoon in her kitchen, in her living room, with the easel set up to receive eight uh, or so, six or eight of us. Who Do you were remember who the other students were? Uh, Jimmy, uh, Don Douglas was there, one of my classmates. And uh, I can't remember Jimmy's last name, but her daughter, uh, Beth, Beth Black, who went on to become a, a, a nun, I think so, yeah. But it was uh, a kind of a hardcore of us who went and gathered there. And it was a, an interesting, I, I say that she was the bohemian in town. She was the artist bohemian who opened her, her house up. And it smelled of paint and turpentine. And she had three or four little French poodles running around underneath <laughs> the chairs. And uh, Dare I disclose this? She had beer in the refrigerator, and it was all uh, up and up, and we had a great time. Well, she was a Catholic. Well, of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's natural that she would have beer in the refrigerator. No, but I, it was it was uh, it was kind of the other side of the football. Now you know that Milshu is wet. Oh yes, I know that. Yeah, my mother called me up uh, when she was still alive, and she said, "Joe." Uh, are you sitting down? I, I, I need to tell you this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, but uh, she, it was sort of the other side of the football, academic life in a small farming and ranching town. It was a, a little bit of Paris, you know, on uh, over in a house uh, on the east side of town, and it was uh, just a wonderful experience. And I credit this to my fundamentals why I am now what I am an architect, an architect. Okay. so it, it was teaching she taught you to see and a lot of people think well I can see yeah but to see deeper than just the surface of things and we were studying light and shadow and 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 painting uh, uh, gestures and features and of course then came after her Rita White who also taught for years and years students uh, in not the school but in her home also. Lessons that were, uh, and this Elizabeth Black, she wrote me a wonderful letter of recommendation to Dartmouth uh, saying that she never quite understood uh, who I was because I would come in after a Friday night football game with a black eye and and limping limping into her house, you know, having been injured in the game the night before, but still full of enthusiasm about making. I thought I was going to make great art, and I, you know, for a 15 or 16 year old, I think it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it? I uh, what can I say? I think it's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the spot, Gail. That, that means <laughs> there are fables involved. <laughs> no, now, you were doing in Princeton, New Jersey, where she grew up, she was doing the same thing at the same time. She was making art with somebody in her community. Princeton is where the university is, and it's a fancy town. You know, it's a, it's, there, it's, was a, there was a person who took me in, and I spent every spare moment I had in the art studio, which didn't get you any academic credit, it didn't get you anywhere, but that was the, you know, oh, but it did, life when I was in high school. It did get you uh, somewhere. It did eventually get me somewhere. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, tell us about the football. Well, I played uh, all four years at Dartmouth, and I came uh, recruited as a recruited athlete because Willie McAlpin, who was the coach at the time, uh, received this letter from uh, the Dartmouth coach and saying, do you have an, an athlete who is academically qualified to survive in the Ivy League and athletically capable of playing college football? And Willie McAlpin, bless his heart, said, here's a letter, a recruiting letter from Darkmouth College. <laughs> and uh, and threw the letter in my in my locker, and I picked it up and and looked at the material that accompanied the letter, and it was full of these photographs of forested uh, 
landscapes and lakes and rivers and you know I was grew up on the plains and I was fascinated by all of this scenery and this potential and I have to admit that I had a little bit of a wanderlust to see what was on the other side of the mountain so to speak my father I think gave me that wanderlust he grew up in Tulia Texas went off to the war and kind of saw the world uh, during the Second World War and always thought it important for his children, my sister Joyce, who was in your class. No. Me, Joyce was in the... Oh, no. no. She's much younger. She was a class of 64. I'm the class of 61. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh, but he thought, my father thought it important on his county agricultural two-week government vacation to take his kids to Yellowstone or to the capital in Washington DC or to Canada and uh, some of the artwork that I have found in my parents house comes from a trip that he took us to Mexico we drove through the heart of Mexico all the way to Mexico City would you do that today well, I have a friend who lives in a place called San Miguel, and, and he says it's not too bad to go. But anyway, I saw things with my wide eyes at age 16 or 17 that I hadn't seen growing up in a fairly middle-class town like Muleshoe, Texas. I saw, among other things, poverty, and the, the kind of hardcore poverty that one sees in Mexico, and that, and that moved me. And I saw wonderful uh, religious architecture, wonderful cathedrals, and, and, and I had my little... Instamatic camera, you remember those little brownie cameras? I took photographs and Elizabeth Black uh, encouraged me. This is a first person experience that you have had through your own eyes. Make something of it. Now, she, let's get back to the football, though, uh, of Dartmouth. Uh, what, what was the significance of that particular football? Well, uh, Dartmouth... At the time, I didn't realize it, but I did my research and found that it was a kind of a football powerhouse in the Ivy League. It had won the last three successive Ivy League championships, and the coach was the, one of the first coaches in the Ivy League or anywhere to institute rec recruiting by computer. He, had, he assembled data banks of excellent athletes from all over the country. And our roster at Dartmouth was like a geographical panoply of the states. I had plays with guys from California and from Arizona and from, of course, the East Coast. Our, our roster was the most diverse of all the Ivy League rosters. There were two, two guys from Texas on my team, me, and uh, oddly enough, someone from Snyder. Really? And, Do you remember his name? Yeah, his name is Murray Bowden. Yeah, we played together. And we came in, I think, as kind of very hard-nosed, hard-hitting, aggressive uh, athletes like none of the other athletes were. <laughs> we, were we were taught to play hard-nosed football, and my senior year, there was a, a new coach called Daryl Oliver. You remember Daryl Oliver, who played football here? And he well, played hey, at well, in the University of Texas. Yes, he played at the University of Texas, was recruited by Daryl Royal. He had come back and was hired as a, an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. So he taught us these new ways of tackling and aggressive. So Daryl was your coach? He was, not the head coach, of course. No. Uh, uh, no. Willie McAlpin was the, the head coach, but Daryl Royal sort of brought the latest and the greatest. But stuff. It's Daryl Oliver. I mean, you know, Daryl Oliver brought the, these new techniques. That and what year was that? Uh, 1966, the 65-66 the season, my senior year. And he, he was the coach for one year, but he mm -hmm. brought a lot of uh, this aggressiveness. And uh, I have to say now the techniques that we were taught then are frowned upon because of the... Uh, the uh, encourage it encourages head injury sure. you know it was uh, but we were we were the kind of the kamikaze guys from Texas we were <laughs> we would uh, sacrifice our body uh. well now I see on here it says Dartmouth 42 and how 
what was the score for Yale? Well, this is the the ball game, the the the, the game ball from my senior year, the game that we played in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale is, in front of about uh, 55,000 people at the Yale Bowl, and it was one of the only games that my father saw me play. The only one? He came and saw the, the Harvard game, which was the week before, and this game. And he stayed, he drove all the way from Muleshoe, Texas. By himself? By himself, and came into Hanover, not knowing where I was. And he called me, and I was living at a fraternity house at the time. And my fraternity brothers came over and ferried him into the house because I was at practice. And ferried him, and they took him under their wing. And he was a fraternity boy at Dartmouth College for a week. It was a hoot for him, for him to do that. And he saw me practice every day. He saw the Harvard game. We won that game. And this was the big game of the season because Yale had dominated us uh, the years before. Uh -huh. And we won the game 42-21. to 21. I had two interceptions that, that led to two scores. And I subsequently got the game ball that is given to the the triumphant team. And in a banquet later on, in, after the season was over with, I was presented with the game ball. Isn't that wonderful? And where did you find it? I found this in a trunk in my parents' garage. I had totally forgotten about it until I was uh, cleaning out their possessions and their, their furniture and so on. So I found this uh, deflated football with uh, the the record of this in in a oh, trunk that's wonderful. but i i i have mounted this myself but i put this on here and it's a tri tribute to jack hay i wish i hope that i can read it here on no november the 1st 1969 at the yale bowl for his outstanding play in new haven connecticut the game ball is awarded to joseph adams whose two interceptions led to two scores Game attended by Joe's father, J.K. Adams, after a long drive from Muleshoe, Texas, to see the Yale versus Dartmouth game before 50,000 fans that afternoon. J.K. was a very vocal presence during the entire game. J.K. himself never had a chance to play football. Go Dartmouth. Go Joe. Go J.K. <laughs> I want my grandchildren to, to see this. So that's why we have... He was a, uh, a child of a family of 10, farm family. His father just laid down the law that none of the boys, there were eight boys, none of the boys were going to play any athletic sports because that was frivolous. We had too much work to do, uh -huh. too many cows to milk, too many rows to hoe after school. So he made it possible for me to play at all turns. You know, I was in 4-H here. I had animals. And... Uh, he made it possible that after the school was out, practice went long, you, you stay, you do the practice, you go to the away games, I'll help out with the animals. So, it, you know, it was making up for something in his lost, lost part of his childhood. And, and he always supported. Now, he went on to college, though. He went to Texas A&M, majored in dairy husbandry, and graduated in the class of 1941 which was the year of Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and he enlisted like 99% of his class, and he went off. And it was an all-boys school. Dude. It was an all-boys school, and everyone was mandatorily in the Corps, mm -hmm. which meant he got up early in the morning and marched, and f dry, he said he dry-fired cannons over and over again because he was in the, in the field artillery. He was learning how to. But he subsequently went into the Navy because... He didn't want to fight in the trenches, mm -hmm. and he thought, I'm going to sign up for the Navy. So he went to Navy Officers Training School in, uh, at Northwestern, which is in uh, north of Chicago, and he was what they called a 90-day wonder. 90 day, three months later, he got a commission. He was a captain in the Navy, and they gave him the captaincy of a PT boat like John Kennedy was uh, PT-109. So J.K. went down to Pensacola, Florida, and they basically said, there's your boat, there's your crew, 
good luck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he had literally. Go ahead and put that okay. down. He had literally never seen the ocean before. Mm -hmm. And there he was, uh, the captain <laughs> of a PT boat. And this uh, PT boat, he ferried around to uh, New Orleans and on Lake Pontchartrain, they did what they called a shakedown cruise. It was a boat that had just come off of the production line, new engines, everything. So they had the shakedown cruise for this war vessel in Lake Pontchartrain, back and forth, back and forth. And these are very fast boats. You know, they go 60 miles an hour on the, they're, they're rescue boats, what they're for, primarily for, down pilots, ships at sea that are in trouble. But uh, he was stationed in the Pacific Theater, but he was stationed in the North Pacific, thank God, because there was not a lot of action in Alaska which is where he ended up. He was the captain during the entire war of a PT boat in the Aleutian Islands, which were invaded momentarily by the Japanese. They occupied two of Attu and Kiska, the, the chain of the islands that come out from Alaska, headed towards Russia. So he saw a little bit of action that way, but most of the time it was fighting these heavy, heavy seas in the Bering, the Bering Sea. You know, there's a, this television program called... Uh, it's about crab fishing in the Bering Sea. And the, the, the boat itself was about 60 feet long. And they encountered 60-foot waves. So it was just uh, this cork on the ocean. And my father didn't have, understandably, because he's a plains boy, he didn't have a great stomach <laughs> for, for those seas. But uh, he weathered that. And I think that's an amazing story about the, the boy who had never been on the ocean being a captain of a boat. And what was your mother doing at this time? She was being a loyal, greatest uh, generation mother. I mean, she wasn't a mother yet, but a wife. They just married upon his graduation. So they were newly married, and she got a cable from my father as his boat was going around up to Alaska from San Diego saying, come to San Diego. So she was at home in her parents' house outside of Mineral Wells, Texas, and she got on a troop train in Fort Worth and rode it to San Diego. Now, how long do you think that took? Oh, I think it was at least a four or five day trip, huh. you know? Sure. And, and I think you can picture it that this was wartime and these trains were full of 24 year old guys and here was this Texas girl on a train full of 24 year old guys but <laughs> Margaret <more>. Adams <laughs> and Margaret Adams <laughs> but she made it there and they uh, reunited after they were this is just after they were married so this was kind of their honeymoon so now what did she do during the war? She followed him as his boat and convoy went up the coast, stopping at Seattle. She followed him via train up to Seattle, and she spent the war in a, as a working for the war effort in a munitions depot at Pier 41 in Seattle. She lived in a little apartment, one-room apartment, with a Murphy bed that came out of the wall, and a hot plate. That was her stove. That was her cooking utensils. So she, uh, he was uh, getting ready to ship out with his boat up to Alaska. She was there. He eventually shipped out. And the whole idea was that he would surely come on leave down to Seattle during his two years up in the Aleutian Islands. He never did. He never got away. And she stayed there patiently going, going to her job every day. And finally, he decided that uh, I've had enough of these heavy seas. I have a horrible stomach. I am going to request a transfer to the submarine service. It's kind of the way J.K. thought. I'm going to I'm going to miss uh, trench warfare by joining the Navy. I hate this heavy seas warf uh, warfare on in the Navy. I'm going to go under the, the seas. <laughs> so he signed up for the uh, submarine service. And that happened in New London, Connecticut, all the way across the country. Yes. So his war bride 
and he packed up in a car and drove all the way to uh, New London, Connecticut, where the submarine school was. Well, I don't think they got there. They did not. J.K., in his typical fashion, wanting to broaden himself by travel, said, we're going to go through Washington, D.C., and we're going to learn a little bit about the history of the country and so on. But now, he had already been there. No, he was on his way to the posting at the submarine but, but I thought he had already been to Washington, D.C. previously. I don't think he had. He had been to Chicago on one of these uh, Santa Fe, when he was a 4-H boy growing up in Tulia, he had seen Chicago. This, they had Santa Fe Awards. The Santa Fe Rail Company awarded uh, well accomplished 4-H boys and, and J.K. Was, had taken his animals to the Dallas. And so in uh, Washington, D.C., say what happened? See, they w were engaged by a, what J.K. said, is a drunk cab driver ferrying these drunk congressmen around late at night. <laughs> and uh, they were, had a head-on accident with this cab driver. My mother went through the windshield, and my father encountered the, the steering column with his head. My mother lost some teeth. My father eventually was designated as uh, two, dis he had a disability that he washed out of the military. Mm -hmm. And he never got to his posting in the submarine service. Again, it sounds tragic, but it may have been the best thing. Well, you know, he got to Muleshoe. <laughs> he, he, he came straight to, to Muleshoe yeah. after he rec recuperated in the Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. He got his feet on the ground. Now, was she able to go to Walter Reed also? Uh, I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, the, the details are... are uh, I, I could never get him to really talk about that because it, it, was, a, it was a tragedy. Sure. But J.K. came back. But not for meal sheet. <laughs> right. He had still had his ear to the ground with his friends. Uh, he, he knew the county agent in Tulia, and the county agent in Tulia told him, there's a job opening in Bailey County. Uh -huh. So as soon as he was able, he beat it back to, Houston, to, to Texas, mule shoe, and he went in to interview in his dress white naval uniform. You know, he had served his country, and I think it may have helped him get the job because... Well, of course it did. <laughs> because... Now, show this other picture here uh, that you have, yes. Uh -huh. And where did you find this? This was also in the closet. My, my mother was a good saver. She preserved not only fruits and vegetables in the bell jars, but she preserved all of the things from my sister's uh, background, from my background. This is a uh, picture of me intercepting a pass in that 1969 season, one of the six passes I intercepted, from a, an athlete at Cornell. That we were playing Cornell. His name is Ed Marinero. Some of you who follow football may know him. He's, that year, he was the Heisman Trophy runner-up. Kind of unheard of that an a Ivy League athlete was in the running for the Heisman Trophy, which is the best designation for the best football player in all of collegiate football. And he eventually played for the Minnesota Vikings and then went on to have a uh, acting career. You may have, really? you may have remembered a serial called Hill Street Blues. Oh, of course. And he was one of the officers in, in Hill Street <laughs> Blues. Well, I intercepted his pass here uh, on a Saturday afternoon in, in New England. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, did you get to go through Margaret's things? Uh, we went through more things than you can imagine because they lived on, uh, it, on the same street in Muleshoe for 70 years. They moved three times, but each time to a bigger house so they didn't throw out anything. <laughs> and we filled two closets in our house with things that I'm not sure we're ever going to unpack. But <laughs> we couldn't throw them away. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, she was a saver, 
uh, for sure. Thank you so much, Joe and Gail Adams. I didn't mean to leave you out of so much of the conversation, but it's been wonderful reminiscing with you about your family and about your accomplishments, Joe Adams, a graduate of Muleshoe High School.